and welcome. Welcome to our exhibition spotlight program. Our journey with trees is inspired by our newest exhibit then and now, 175 years on the Pentecrest, which honors the university's landmark anniversary among various themes of exploration. Our webinar will kick off today exploring the evolution of our campus landscape and the important connections green spaces like these support health, wellness, culture, and community. The Pentecrest Museum served to strengthen the vital role in the educational research and engagement missions of the university, enhancing the campus-wide focus on cultural and environmental diversity. Our journey with trees is not only significant to our, our health and well-being, but it's also serving to bring awareness and acknowledgement that the Pentecrest Museums and the University of Iowa stand on the native homelands of the Chippewa, the Iowa, the Kickapoo, Menominee, Miami, Missouri, Omaha, Osage, Oto, Ottawa, Ponca, Potawatomi, Meskwaki, Sauk, and Fox of the Mississippi and Iowa, the three affiliated tribes and the Ho-Chunk nations. The following tribal nations, Omaha tribe of Nebraska of Iowa, the Ponca tribe of Nebraska, Meskwaki, Sauk, and Fox of the Mississippi and Iowa, and the Ho-Chunk nations continue to thrive in the state of Iowa, and we continue to acknowledge them. As an academic institution, it is our responsibility to acknowledge the sovereignty and the traditional territories of these tribal nations and the disposition that have allowed for the growth of these of the, the dispossession that has allowed for the growth of this institution since 1847. Consistent with the university's commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, understanding the historical and current experiences of Native peoples will help inform the work we do collectively as a university to engage in building relationships through academic scholarship, collaborative partnerships, community service, enrollment, and retention efforts acknowledging our past, our present, and future Native nations. To learn more about the land you stand on and become an advocate for this recognition, please visit the following sites that'll be in the chat. This exhibition program has been made possible through the hard work of staff and students at the Pentecrest Museums with support from partners in facilities management, management and human resources. I would be a re remiss if I didn't extend our gratitude to the Office of the Vice President of Research, which makes our museum work possible. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce you to our panel. Please help me welcome Andrew Dahl, University of Iowa Urban Forestry Supervisor and Campus Arborist, who has dedicated over 22 years of award-winning service, providing supervision, care, and education to over 8,000 trees on campus. Megan Hamas is a certified health and wellness coach and serves as the University of Iowa Human Resources Senior Director of UI Wellness, leading initiatives that support the well-being of over 20,000 faculty and staff. I also welcome Suzanne Bartlett, Hackenmiller, physician and author who, has, who is board certified in both OBGYN and integrative medicine and is a UI College of Medicine alumna. Today, Dr. Hackenmiller shares her personal experience with healing effects of time outdoors in nature and is a certified forest therapy guide. Finally, we're honored to have Luke Capello of the Meskwaki Food Sovereignty serving as the ancestral farming manager who dedicates his time to engage in the education and sustainability of traditional Meskwaki farming, gathering, hunting, and fishing practices. Today, Mr. Capello will share in his relationship with trees as a celebrated farmer and wood carver. We welcome you all. And without further ado, Andy, please feel free to take the podium. Well, good day, everyone. Thank you for having me all of us, Carolina, appreciate it. Well, we'll get going. We're going to go in the time machine, so buckle up. We're going back to 1853 before computer glitches. We had this new thing called photography coming out. So this is one of the first photos of uh, widely known as one of the first photos of the University Dole Capitol building. So this is 1853. And a lot of the early uh, words written about the Pentecrest or at this time the capital was it just had a scattering of a few oak trees this, these were left over from before the land was settled so uh, as we see in the 1860s uh, when the university had taken over that the capital had moved to Des Moines I believe in 1857 so uh, this photo on your left is from 1869 and there's a lot of literature 
about how there was a an effort to plant trees in the 1860s in a grid-like pattern, primarily elms. So we see on the left, uh, 1869, you can see some of these trees coming in, starting to grow. And then on the right photo, I believe that dates from 1880, you can see them starting to mature. Um, there is a wonderful resource I used a lot of, uh, and it's Landscaping of the Old Capitol, a preliminary investigation from 1979 by a Cecilia Joshua Rusnak that is just full. It's like a diary. Um, for instance, uh, the janitor was directed to buy a dog to keep livestock off of the trees on the Pentecrest and to uh, keep all the town boys from playing and damaging the trees. So that's pretty fun. So here is a photo from 1902, soon after Schaefer Hall was erected. And you can see a lot of these trees uh, weren't damaged by roving livestock or, or young hoodlums. Um, one thing in this photo I do want to point out, there is a, a tree with a fork in the left hand. You'll see the cursor going over it. I will make special mention of that tree soon, but it's still on campus. So um, in 1905, the university uh, wanted to establish a master plan of what to do with the, the Pentecrest, uh, what direction to go, and they contacted the Olmsted and Associates. They, these are the folks that Frederick Law Olmsted, uh, they designed Central Park, a lot of campuses were involved with the Biltmore in North Carolina, uh, had a very good reputation at the time. While the university uh, took bits and pieces, they didn't implement the whole plan. One of the things they mentioned was removing all the brick buildings off the Pentecrest. So all the existing and Pre, uh, future buildings would be all the same style, the Beaux art style. So there wouldn't, there'd be a uniformity to it. Um, so one of the buildings they did not raise, they actually moved this. Some viewers may not know this. Calvin Hall, which is on Jefferson Street, used to be where McBride Hall is, where the Museum of Natural History is. It's just amazing to me. They held classes while they moved this building. You stand at the bottom of that and you're like, how in the world did they do this? Um, so they moved that, and um, some of the other things that happened were some of the trees had to come down, unfortunately, in, in the process. And this was the pride of campus. Uh, there's a picture uh, of a man holding a cane with a hat. That's the president of the university as they're digging this tree up. Wouldn't that make you feel uh, uh, great having someone peering over your shoulder, making sure you're taking down this tree correctly? But they made a chair out of this. And I had heard about this over the years and Josie Newman from the International Writers Center as visiting with her about planting some trees there. She goes, I think there's something you might like in the basement. And I went down and here's this chair and it has a photo of this very tree. It was made out of that tree. And also I found a photo from 1904 in the Shambaugh house of that uh, chair, you can see it in the photo on the right. So uh, that's pretty neat to see that piece of history. Um, one of the other things uh, Olmsted's um, associates wanted to want the university to do was to have the East Lawn be the front yard of the university. Uh, uh, large trees, uh, uh, spaces where people could gather and, and hear speeches, uh, music, uh, have commencement, that sort of thing. And then the West Lawn would be more open, rough, picturesque. And you can see that in the photo on the left that dates from the 40s, the aerial. But you can see the West Lawn is pretty open with just a few scattered trees, while the East Lawn is, is quite forested. And you can see that in the picture on the right also. Those are some of the big trees that were planted in the 1860s. And those are primarily elms. Now let's we're we're going fast. Wow, that's a lot of years. We're to the present already. So, are any of those trees left? People ask me, "What's the oldest tree on 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 the Pentecrest?" Well, here are two of them. The one on the left is the state champion American elm, and that's the tree that I had the cursor on in the earlier photo from 1902. I figure these were planted in the 18 late 1860s, early 1870s. Uh, the one on the right is the state champion black walnut. Uh, some of you may know that tree is the one with the lightning protection in it. 
And here's the crew in 2013 climbing the tree to put lightning protection in. It was quite a big job. It was initially installed in 1982, but the tree had outgrown the, the terminal. So we had to put a new system in. And then all, oh, everyone knows about this iconic large. How many of you, I wish I could see how many hands were, were, were being raised. How many of you sat on that branch when you were at Jazz Fest? Very good, Suzanne, I see your hand. You so, can put it in a chat as well <laughs> if you want, yeah. What a neat, iconic tree. No, it wasn't 200 years old. The oldest photos I found of it were from 1953, but everyone loved that tree. Well, unfortunately it went down in a storm in 2019. Luckily, we were able to find another one, sizable one to replace it with. It came from Chicago. It even has the low branch. So I'm hoping sometime future generations will get to crawl over that lower, lower branch too. Uh, the future. So, you know, this is a, that was a, a rendering by Sasaki and Associates. And there's talk of making them, the Pentacrest to be even more, user-friendly, pedestrian-friendly, to become a hub for the community. Um, one of the other things to do, the next, here's a group that's planted an Arbor Day tree in American Beach on the Pentacrest, is to learn from the past mistakes. When the elms that were planted in the 1860s started to die in the 1960s from Dutch elm disease, they were replaced with ash trees. Well, we all know about the emerald ash borer, so we've been taking those down. One of the things we want to continue to do is diversify so we don't have that major loss of, of trees. Um, something else that's coming up next Arbor Day, we, are, we have been chosen to receive one of, I think it's 13 of these trees in the world. It's an actual progeny off the Anne Frank tree that was outside uh, her hiding place there in Amsterdam. So we're going to have a big ceremony on Arbor Day. Everyone's invited. It starts at 5 five o'clock on the uh, on the McBride steps. So we hope to see people there. It's very exciting. Uh, Kirsten Kumpf-Bali, a professor of German, was, was instrumental in sending out the application. We've got a real good uh, group committee moving that forward. So it's gonna be really exciting. So I'd just like to say, you know, uh, the Pentecrest has been a, a place over the years, generations, whether it's 1910 commencement or Jazz Fest, for the community to come together. And I, I hope that continues where the past, present and future can all be intertwined and for people to enjoy it. So thank you so much. And if any questions, just email them, they'll get to me. So thank you. And thank you, Andy. That was wonderful to hear that journey and time travel. I really appreciate that. I'm now excited to bring on Megan Hammes. Yeah, thank you, Carolina. Thanks so much, Andy. I'm so excited about the Anne Frank tree and, and if only our trees could talk, right? They could tell some stories. So to switch gears a little bit, um, I'm going to talk about some of the people of our institution. So my role at the university is primarily focused on our 18,000 plus full-time faculty and staff. As all of you are well aware, we have a very large and dynamic campus. Our main campus, of course, is right in the heart of Iowa City, but we also have our research park campus in Coralville that includes our um, heroes from the state hygienic lab, many community health care clinics and offices all around the state. Um, and so as we think about our employees of the University of Iowa, we're around the clock entity, you know, with our healthcare and research enterprise. We have over 100 buildings on our main campus alone. So Andy and his crew do an absolutely amazing job of taking care of many of our outdoor physical spaces. We have, we have a lot of indoor spaces as well. So think doctors, nurses, our faculty instructors, researchers, persons with student life and a student focus working in the residence halls. So a lot of service to the state and research. And we, of course, can't forget our over 30,000 students that are enrolled at the University of Iowa. So um, you can advance, Carolina. So um, at the university, I'm very fortunate because we do take our commitment to well-being very seriously for our employees and our students. So I want to read for you kind of our definition of well-being. 
um, that it's a process focused on lifelong learning that promotes and sustains optimal health, personal connectedness, meaningful experiences, and a purposeful life. So we want every one of our people to be able to show up as their best and authentic self every day when they come to work. So if you scan the QR code, or I think Liz will put it in the chat, you can, you can kind of see the, the breadth of programs and services and messages that we provide to our employees. And well-being really encompasses anything that impacts how we're feeling, our relationships, the environment around us, our safety, physical health, our energy, and our mood. And some of the protective factors that can help us to thrive include strong social connections, being mindful still or present, preferably without the aid of an app or a screen, <laughs> um, spending time outdoors, being physically active, nourishing our body with foods that give us energy. And the last two years, have been extremely challenging. I haven't heard a single person say, wow, these past two years have been the best of my life, smooth sailing. Haven't heard a single person say that. We have some research that was collected on our campus by the UI College of Public Health's Healthier Workforce Center of the Midwest, where they surveyed University of Iowa employees four times from May 2020 to May 2021. And the survey results indicated a continued negative impact of the COVID pandemic on our employee well being. Certain demographic groups are kind of appearing to be most impacted, although certainly all of us have been impacted. But the most impacted appear to be younger employees, parents of young children, and on site clinical workers, specifically those in a healthcare setting. While these findings are for the University of Iowa employees, studies all around the country and the globe have kind of corroborated the same thing. The program that I work with, which is a part of University Human Resources Live Well, we've had an employee survey since 2006, and that's our personal health assessment survey where we saw similar trends. So 2019, I consider that kind of the last maybe normal year that we've had. And then 2021, the last full year that we have data for, um, we have seen more stress, lower health behaviors and areas of physical activity, nutrition. We saw cigarette smoking increase for the first time since we've been measuring this. If you're looking at the graph, one percentage point doesn't, does, you know, like, oh, not a big deal, only 2%, but as we've said over 18,000 full-time employees work at the university. So that actually means hundreds of people picking up one of the, the behaviors that we know is, is detrimental to our health and well-being. So positively, after um, kind of uh, some, some doom and gloom data from the last two years, and Carolina, you can, you can uh, advance, um, we know that the last two years have been hard, but we all hold so much hope as Andy articulated with a couple of weeks or next Friday, we have the planting of this Anne Frank tree on campus. I think this quote can serve as a compass for bouncing forward in a positive and productive fashion, taking care of ourselves so that we can do our important work of caring for others as I, I think where we're at right now in preparation to bounce forward. So with that, I can turn it over to Suzanne. All right. Well, thank you, Megan. Oh, I didn't know this photo was coming up. <laughs> I love it. Uh, what a great segue to what I'm speaking about. Thank you, and Andy and Megan both. So Carolina asked me to join you to talk about nature and forest therapy and the health benefits of time spent in nature. And so I decided to use this tree as my first slide, because as you look up into this tree, you see this gorgeous beautiful specimen. Um, but it's really important to notice the bottom of the tree because this is a city tree. And this is a photo that I took in Oregon. And we often forget that we can derive tremendous health benefits from spending time among trees that are in our midst, that are city trees, that are trees of the Pentecrest. So, so that was why I chose this photo. And you can go to the next slide. Carolina also asked me to, to share a little bit of my background and how I came to be an OBGYN graduate of the College of Medicine at the University of Iowa, um, very conventionally minded physician who now is prescribing nature to my patients. And 
So this is a photo taken back in 2011 of my family. Um, and these are my two kids who are now 19 and 21. And uh, my husband, Dave, was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer in 2008 and subsequently passed away in 2012. Um, my son um, deals with autism. And um, these are the kinds of things that made me ask questions about what we're doing in conventional medicine. They um, they motivated me to study integrative medicine, which combines alternative and complementary approaches with conventional medicine. And so I did a fellowship through the University of Arizona and learned a lot more about the other ways we can support people, our patients, my family, ourselves. Um, I studied herbal medicine for a few more years after that. And you can go to the next slide. Um, and then after my husband passed away, I found that my personal healing took place outdoors in nature. At first, it was all about the adrenaline rush, um, mountain biking, um, trail running. I had to be moving all the time and then soon recognized the need to find balance for myself and for my own healing. Um, I learned in about 2015 about this concept of forest bathing. And I'll talk a little bit more about this in a moment. Um, and so, and you can actually go back for a sec. So a couple of the pictures on this other slide um, are this act of forest bathing, including a tea ceremony there. And the picture of the lower left is my current husband, Joe, was never going to get married again, but life happens. And so these are some photos of forest bathing and outdoor adventure and the fact that we can find healing in all kinds of different ways of using space outdoors. So now you can go to the next one. So. Like I said, I learned of this concept of forest bathing, which is a translation from the Japanese term shindin yoku, literally translates to forest bathing. And it's this idea of just slowing down in nature, taking it in through the various senses in a very mindful way. We also encourage the experience of awe and wonder, which is what separates forest bathing from a true mindfulness practice, but it's all about slowing down and just taking it in. It's something that you can do with with a certified guide. Um, as Carolina mentioned, I am certified as a forest therapy guide. And now we have a number of them in the state of Iowa and also all around the country. So you can go to the next slide. Um, it's been found in a number of studies and I won't go through all of this right now, but this practice of forest bathing has numerous effects on human health in terms of lowering cholesterol, lowering blood pressure. It's been found to even help our immune system and numerous studies have looked at the mental health effects of spending time out in nature in this way. You can go on to the next one. I wanted to just show a few photos of forest bathing because it can look all kinds of different ways. Um, you, can, you can see the lower picture is on a paved sidewalk down in Honey Creek at Honey Creek Resort in Southern Iowa. And um, just the fact that, that it may not always look like you would think in a deep forest, it can be done anywhere. You can move to the next slide. Uh, in fact, we've done forest bathing in kayaks and combined it with all kinds of different forms of outdoor adventure. You can go to the next slide. So one of the interesting things, I'm just gonna talk about some of the studies that have found ways in which time in nature is healing because I think it so connects with what Megan was talking about and what we're trying, I think, you know, worldwide now post or intra pandemic to figure out how to manage ourselves after what we've all gone, gone through. Um, and so one of these is this notion of the phytoncides and phytoncides are chemicals emitted from the essential oils and plants, especially coniferous, coniferous trees. And it's been found that when we inhale and ingest these phytoncides, that not only not only do these chemicals help the plant to protect it against uh, fungus and bacteria, but when we inhale the fragrance of the essential oils, we're also deriving those same benefits for ourselves. So when we spend time in nature, it has been found to help us to fight um, bacteria, fungi, which is really, you know, viruses important during a pandemic. It's been found too that it causes our natural killer cells, one of the parts of our immune system to rise. I think you can go on to the next slide. I talk about natural killer cells. Um, it was found that in people participating in a forest bathing um, excursion for 
three days and two nights, maybe longer than we all have time to, but think of a long weekend just out in nature, that after people did this, their natural killer cells rose in both number and level of activity for not only immediately after their experience, but seven days out and even as far out as 30 days after their experience. So just spending a long weekend out in nature benefits your immune system in this way for as long as a month out. So I think that's pretty remarkable. Um, so we'll talk about some mental health studies and I'll try, try to kind of quickly go through these, but if this is something people would like more information about, they're welcome to reach out to me. Um, one study found that when people took a 90 minute walk in nature versus in a more urban setting, that they had less self-reported rumination. In other words, that cycling of stressful thoughts that sometimes we get into. And that also when they put these individuals in functional MRI machines, that they had decreased activity in the part of their brain that was associated with with sadness, withdrawal, and negative self-reflection. So it was actually found on an MRI study that these changes had occurred. You can go to the next one. Another study looked at 36 people who chose their own activity outdoors. And they found that there was a benefit at about 20 to 30 minutes of doing whatever it is you enjoy doing outdoors, that it actually was found to lower stress hormones in the participant's saliva, specifically hormones called cortisol and alpha amylase. So again, just choosing your activity, could be gardening, could be walking, could be bird watching, could be anything. 20 to 30 minutes was found to reduce the stress hormones in your saliva. Next slide. Um, another study looked at over 19,000 participants who either spent time in nature or just had no nature exposure and found that there was an increased likelihood that people would report better sense of well-being and overall happiness when they took the time to spend time outdoors and that this benefit occurred with when, when they got to kind of a threshold of 120 minutes per week. They found that they could continue to raise the, the threshold up to 200 to 30 hundred, or 300, sorry, 200 to 300 minutes per week and not have any additional gain. So, so there's a sweet spot about 120 minutes per week of nature exposure has benefits on your overall well being. Next slide. Uh, and this is one of my favorite studies because it's so simple. This took place on a college bench and this is the exact bench that was used in the study. And they had college students take five minutes sitting on this bench, detached, disconnected from their devices for just five minutes, as opposed to controls who sat in a windowless laboratory. And for the five minutes, uh, for the participants who spent five minutes on this bench outdoors in a park, similar to on a bench near the Pentecrest, that these people had a statistically significant improvement in overall positive emotions. When they repeated this study and increased the duration of time to 15 minutes, they found no increased benefit over just five minutes, disconnected from your devices, sitting on a bench outdoors. And next slide. So those are a quick overview of some of my more favorite studies, particularly ones looking at mental health. But I think it's so app applicable to us in this time uh, globally that, that nature is confirming, or I'm sorry, science is confirming that time spent in nature really is healing both to our physical and our mental health. And it's so simple. It could be 20 minutes a day. It could be shooting for that 120 minutes per week, or if nothing else, just trying to find five minutes to carve out of your day to spend time outdoors. Thank you, Suzanne. And th th this is wonderful because it's so attainable, which is really, really helpful. Um, thank you so much for all that wonderful information. And we'll also share that uh, Suzanne has written a book called Forest Bathing, which you see here, <laughs> and is available at the museum and at Prairie Lights. Thank you, Carolina. And now we get to slow it down with Luke. So thank you. Thank you. Luke, it's all you. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm happy to be here today to talk about trees. I can talk about trees all the time. Um, first, I just want to say that I'm a, a husband, a father, and a grandfather. Uh, my wife and I have 10 kids, 15 grandkids. Um, we are from 
the Meskwaki tribe here in Iowa. Our people have been here a long time since before Iowa was a state and started coming here before the United States was a country. Um, the first thing we can talk about is my job and what my coworkers and I do every year uh, for food sovereignty. Every year um, we have interns that come work with us for about six months. And we have four getting ready to come on very soon, uh, probably in a couple of weeks. Um, and this picture you see here is one of our smallest gardens. It's about 30 feet by 60 feet. And that's our demonstration garden. And what we grow are our native heirloom, corn, beans, and squash. And these are seeds that came from our ancestors. And we believe that we've been growing them for thousands of years. And that's one of the reasons why we think they're very important to us. And in our job, we help the community with their gardens. We have a tractor with a plow and a tiller. If, if they need us to come help till, we can do that. If they need seeds, we can give them seeds. And we try and, we don't wanna lose what the seeds that we have. And we can move to the next picture we got there. And this is just a picture of our interns last year helping one of the families with their garden to show them how to plant. Um, one thing I wanna talk about too is, uh, I wanna get to trees and something I just wanna share with you all is that my point of view and for all native Americans, indigenous people, the way we look at the world is, is different than most people when it comes to our earth and the trees. And we consider the earth our grandmother. And all trees are grandfathers. Like in, in our language, we have names for all the trees that we know. I'll give you some examples. Um, like silver maple is shishigima, sugar maple is asanamish, hickory is beshkipa, and we have a name for all the trees, and our name is mehtegwinaniak, and what that means is the tree people. So to us, Seas, trees are very sacred and we just don't go around cutting trees down and bulldozing trees over. Um, if anyone has ever seen our settlement, you, you probably notice that we have a lot of trees here. And when we, if we cut down a tree, we, we only cut down a few and what we use and what we need. And before we cut a tree, we, we give tobacco to that tree, to the spirit of that tree, who is our grandfather. Let's move to, I think we have a, a video to share. And this, is, this video is our interns. And this is when we were out in the timber.
they have to be more around here. I really like that video. One of our interns did a very good job putting that together. Um, and Suzanne, I, I guess we were for the forest bathing, weren't we? That was a very good day. You absolutely um, were. Yeah. Uh, You'll have to forgive me. I have to advance the slides. It's the way PowerPoint is set up. So apologies for that. We yeah, will advance straight to Luke. You can keep talking, Luke, if you all right. there's still time. Yeah. The next thing I wanted to say was just a real quick story on how I started carving. And I started, well, first I, I grew up with uh, my grandparents and uncles and mom and my grandfather and uncles all were wood carvers. So uh, when I was about 18 or 19, I was out driving around in my truck cutting wood and I seen a bump on a tree and I thought, hey, that looks like I could make a spoon out of that. So I cut it off and I made a spoon and I showed one of my uncles and he he told me, well, he said it in Meskwaki, but what he said was, uh, you, you just about know how to make one. And what he suggested was that um, a man I used to know who's who's gone now, his name is Arthur Black Cloud. He was a well-known master carver, master wood carver. He suggested that I go to art and have him teach me the right way. <laughs> so about a week later, my uncle told me, hey, I talked to art. He said for you to come on over. So I went to his house and picked him up. We went out and we cut some wood some box elder and he showed me how he carved a spoon and he was taught by his father i started carving since about since it was in the late 1970s and in this picture i'm holding two bowls that are made from box elder and those spoons that are in those were from the same tree so they kind of match and what we cut is for bowls are usually storm damaged trees. And right now we have many of them from that the ratio we had in 2020. So most of the wood we use is from that storm. And this past winter, I've been working with a couple younger men from, from here and they, I'm working with them on carving bowls and spoons. You could move to the next picture. Yeah, the gentleman on the left sitting there with his son and some of the bowls he made. 
And then on the right is my other friend, Miles, with some of the ladles and spoons and cooking paddles that he made. So right now, both of those guys are carving and they have orders from people for more stuff. And these bowls and spoons are very important to us because we still use them here. We use them for our ceremonies. And this is an art form that goes back, way back. And I've tried to find other wood carvers from other tribes, and I haven't found any. Um, it's almost like a, a lost art, but we're, we're still, we're keeping it here. And I think that's about all, all I can say for now. Thank well, you thank very you. much. Thank you, Luke. I must say that um, all these personal stories, both from you, Suzanne, Andy, you do so much for our communities, uh, so much. And I think a lot of people take for granted, but um, with the help of all of our partners here, like Megan, we're hoping to spread the word more that people should take advantage, even if it's five minutes, as Suzanne suggested, to be among nature for whatever reason, but that it is helpful and it's a way to connect. So thank you all and Luke for ending on that in terms of the meaning behind our relationship with trees. It, it, there, there is, we have, we will have, and as long as we can keep them, as this quote says, society is defined not only by what it creates, but what it refuses to destroy. We have to refuse to destroy. I want to share some call to action items that um, and invitations to the public that you are welcome to participate and engage both uh, here at the University of Iowa and, and beyond uh, and in support of conservation in support of our trees. I'm holding tree talks, uh, tree walks on the Pentacrest and uh, it's a wonderful opportunity on the lunch hour on uh, any giving day. My hope is that we will launch this Friday, pending the weather, uh, this Friday, rain or shine. But if it is thundering, we will provide a new date uh, to uh, look out for. Uh, so please pay attention to our social media channels for that. Um, we also have a wonderful website, which it will be, um, this will all be provided in the chat for you. Uh, uh, from our landscape services. So this would be Andy's realm. This is all the different initiatives that Andy and his team and in landscape services supports, including a tree inventory app. You can see exactly what tree is planted, how old they are, what they're called uh, on this app, amongst other things that you can learn about our Arboretum because uh, the University of Iowa is an official Arboretum. And as Megan mentioned, um, there are different ways that people on campus, uh, uh, staff and uh, staff and the um, a wellness center can connect audiences with uh, the different green spaces throughout, uh, including some of our tree stops from the tree tour. And that's through the scavenger hunt. Um, or staff, please look out for the Live Well newsletter, which I've also put uh, a link to in the chat. And finally, and additionally, I want to add that if you want to learn more about uh, Luke's amazing work and his team at the Meskwaki Food Sovereignty, I've provided two links, one to the Facebook page, which you are welcome to like, join, support, and the website, the official website of the Meskwaki Nation, Sock and Fox Tribe of the Mississippi in Iowa. Uh, in Iowa. Please check them out. Um, there's a lot of wonderful information in history and current initiatives that the Meskwaki Nation uh, uh, supports and um, is uh, highly engaged in. And of course, as I mentioned before, Suzanne, our honored guest and alumna, uh, has a wonderful book that I highly recommend, especially if you've enjoyed hearing what she had to say today. She has a book out, which is at the University of Iowa Museum of Natural History shop, and also at Prairie Lights right here in downtown Iowa. And if you're not, uh, if that's not available, you could look online. Uh, you can order those as well. Um, and finally, I'd like to mention that um, our story and history and connection with trees and forestry uh, and conservation is not uh, one that is uh, to any one 
particular group or majority, but many people are supporting. Um, and there are a lot of wonderful, even um, people from minority groups that are very much involved in uh, including many indigenous nations uh, in support of conservation and the rights to, to land, to water, uh, the rights to help share in conservation efforts for all communities, including um, uh, for African-American communities. Uh, the Outdoor Afro is a highly recommended uh, site to support uh, and engage in. If you're curious, Wings of America supports Native youth in learning about um, tree conservation and other forms of conservation. And Corazón Latino um, uh, is also a, a wonderful uh, organization to look into, which Suzanne actually recommended in her book. And you can read more about that as well well. Um, I want to provide the opportunity now for anyone to ask questions. Um, we have about 10 minutes and uh, our, I'm going to stop sharing now and uh, allow audiences to ask questions in our Q&A. Uh, we have about 10 minutes, which is great. And thank you so much, especially for hanging on in there when I had some technical difficulties in the beginning. I'm very appreciative of your patience. And I'm so glad we were able to begin again and ev everyone was on time. It was wonderful. So thank you. Great. So we have some questions. Let's check out the Q&A. Oh, and if anybody has questions, if you haven't, you can submit, sorry, you can submit your questions in the chat. Uh, and um, you can also submit it in the Q&A. We'll be paying attention to those. Okay, so we have a question for, for Andy. Um, what is lightning protection? Oh, it's a series of, of wires and terminals to that we install in the tree to a ground out in the lawn to prevent the tree from being struck by lightning. Uh, that was the initial uh, why it was installed in the 80s because the tree had been struck and, and lightning strikes can be deadly to trees. So that's why that's what it is. So. Uh, another question for you, if that's all right, is as you work uh, to diversify trees on campus, what consideration is given to the inclusion of native fruit and nut trees? A lot. It's just, it's hard to put black walnuts or persimmons or pawpaws in sidewalk cutouts, but we have those. We, we plant quite a few, I lean native, um, but we have over 330 species of trees on campus, but I really like the natives. They. Uh, the, the minutia, the, the insect larva, the, the, the birds they support, just everything, it just fits so well into the program. We do have an orchard out near the tennis center with some native fruits. We have some pecans, um, pawpaws, persimmons there, as, as well as apples, chestnuts, some of the more common things. Thank you for that. Um, I have a question for Luke from the audience. Uh, one, um, how can A, we, we support the Muskoki food sovereignty if people want to support. And, and is it possible to purchase bowls, your beautiful bowls? Well, for food sovereignty, we're, we're a nonprofit. Um, we can get, we can take donations and we would put it in good use. Um, as far as purchasing a bowl that we make, um, Yesterday, one of our carvers got a message and somebody wanted to buy, a, order a bunch of uh, bowls from him. And he, we had to tell, or he told that person that, well, we can't take any orders because we can't keep up with people who want bowls and spoons here. So we, we don't really sell to the outside. And sometimes, you know, we'll, we'll help other tribes and other states, but we're, we're not, we're not looking to try and sell more bowls and spoons. Thank you for answering that. Mm -hmm. um, I'll turn back another question to, um, to Andy. Um, will there be additional trees planted on the Pentecrest to replace the trees lost in the straight line winds and storms over the past few decades? 
I would ask if maybe there's similar th similar efforts in, at the Meskwaki Nation as far as trees that go down. But Andy, go ahead and start off. Sure. Yeah, the straight line winds of 98, the west side of the Pentacrest, they lost. That was the year before I started, but I think I heard the figure about 70 trees. It really changed the landscape. So we have been putting trees back in. Um, yeah, uh, we're going to continue to diversify. We have a lot of, of different species. We don't have the whole uh, perimeter of the tree of uh, the Pentacrest lined with the same species of trees. Uh, we don't, we've learned from the, the past mistakes of nothing but elms or nothing but ashes. So uh, yeah, um, I think there's about a hundred different species of trees and shrubs on the Pentacrest. I, I can't remember, I should look this up, the number of trees that we've planted there in the last 20 years, but it, it's in the hundreds. So uh, they're small now, but they'll keep growing. Great, and actually, Andy, you, uh, you had an interesting question to Luke about deer. I believe it does. Uh, it's a, how do you keep the how do you keep deer out of the out of your garden, or how do you how do you um, control uh, deer in the gardens, for example? That's hard. Can be hard to do, especially lately. It never used to be a big problem, but there's a lot more deer now. And like the biggest thing for deer is, well, we usually pick the corn anyway before the deer get to it, but it's not that big a problem. The bigger problem is the beans, like because rabbits really like beans. So, and what I do at my house is I'm lucky because our my dogs keep the rabbits away but, <laughs> but we, we've been using more fences and we use temporary fences so great um another question uh, is coming in can you see the tree planting from the pentacrest webcam for next week's and frank sapling planting uh no uh there is a camera trained on it for security reasons, but it's not accessible to the general public. So it's just out of the range, I'm afraid. It'll be better to watch it in person anyway, if you can come out. So, <laughs> we're working on that. I, I'm still not sure if we're going to have another camera installed for like kind of like the Decora Eagle cam, you know, watch the in Frank tree grow. We're working on it. I, we'll just have to see about that. Great, and I actually have a question for everyone. Um, what do you hope people can, um, from like, like picture 20 years from now, what does the future look like for either your work, your practice? Uh, what do you hope uh, for, the, for future generations to continue uh, or to, um, to continue on in terms of what you do? Because each of you contribute in very many different ways towards wellness, health, community, culture, and when it comes to nature. Yes, I'll, Megan. I'll start and it's to summarize everybody's amazing work, less screens, more outside time, more appreciation of nature and beauty. The need will always remain. I'll add to that. And my hope is that as people appreciate the healing effects of time in nature, that they'll recognize that it's a reciprocal experience. When we are healed by nature, we're more likely to put importance in healing nature itself. And we have to start acknowledging that. I find that when I take people out um, in a forest bathing kind of walk, they look at things very differently. They no longer see nature as a resource or as something that they can get from, but that's something that we can and must give back to. I hope that younger generations, much like Luke is, is teaching, you know, the newer generations how to, to, uh, utilize the wood, use the forest, carve the bowls. I, I hope we can 
uh, get the youth on board, uh, you know, playing the screen down, like Megan said, and, um, and um, see the joy of nature and what it can do and, and the health benefits of it, as Suzanne's pointed out. And no ash trees. <laughs> I hope to see more people uh, like protecting trees and not using bulldozers to put them in a pile and burn them. I think we need more trees in Iowa and especially along creeks and rivers. And, you know, the birds and the animals need, need a place too. And we like picking mushrooms, we need trees, you know? And I, I hope that more young people get interested in carving and growing their own gardens. Thank you. Those are wonderful, wonderful. Thank you very much collectively. Those are wonderful messages uh, and ways and we provided and we'll follow up with this recording for registrants. We'll follow up with these resources uh, once the video is ready to be shared out. Um, additionally, um, you found different ways that you can participate in both tree walks or yourself at home. Uh, uh, get Suzanne's book uh, or similar resources at our library and also at Prairie Lights. Uh, and just stay well informed and connected. We're all connected to trees. And, uh, and that's what I'm excited about in these tree tours coming up is to really share not just in the meaning, the cultural aspects of our trees, but our connections to both healing and nature and well-being, uh, and in literary uh, literary history as well, like Anne Frank wrote about uh, the tree, her, the impact of trees and what it meant to her in terms of freedom um, and and hope for the future. So um, with that, I want to thank everyone on this panel. Uh, we'll see you next week for those that want to attend the tree planting. We'll see you hopefully either this Friday or in, a, in an announced um, uh, announce. We will announce if we need to reschedule our tree tours and, of course, the websites to support everyone on this panel and their work. So thanks again, and we appreciate you may now exit the webinar at this time.